the, the circumstance of this relates to uh, what has happened post um, the Building Safety Act uh, 2022 and the government's um, proposals for a building safety remediation fund. Uh, but the, what has happened uh, apropos of that is that there seem to be a large number of leaseholders who are actually excluded, including all those who are in sub 11 metre blocks. And we believe that there are hundreds of thousands of these affected leaseholders up and down the country. Um, and they've written to me in significant numbers uh, and uh, I've probably had in excess of 240 separate emails from people uh, since the beginning of, of April. And they're all saying much the same thing, that they are um, aff afflicted by uh, substantial hikes in their insurance uh, costs, in their management fees, and they face swinging remediation costs, and that they are unable to sell their flats. Uh, they are in fear in some instances of repossession, and uh, the whole toxicity of the thing in some cases has uh, stop people from uh, proceeding with their wedding plans or starting a family or having to move back with um, a parental home because they are uh, unable to otherwise deal with the, the fallout from this. I see this as a failure to provide safe homes that were constructed or should have been constructed in accordance with the building code. This seems to be a straightforward failure consumer protection. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Alison Hills, who is going to talk about uh, the matter from a technical standpoint about what these amendments actually seek to do and how they function. Alison, over to you. Thank you, Lord Lytton. Um, so I'm a solicitor who's personally been affected by the building safety crisis. I have a one bedroom flat in St Albans, um, which has a number of defects, including HPL cladding, Kingspan, K15 insulation, missing fire breaks, flammable materials on balconies. Um, I've been involved in campaigning for a number of years um, following, obviously, um, the Grenfell tragedy. And we have come a long way since... Um, obviously the last few years with some protections under the Building Safety Act. Um, but however, sadly, it isn't enough to protect all leaseholders. Um, the aim of this presentation is really to run through the holes in the Building Safety Act as I see them um, and how the amendment works and how the Building Safety Remediation work, Scheme works in practice um, and how it also deals with the problems in the Building Safety Act. So this is obviously now we're at the sixth anniversary of Grenfell. Um, this is the sixth version of the amendment that we've actually tabled now. Um, initially, the amendment was tabled by Dr. Liam Fox. Um, it's since been tabled by the Bishop of Manchester in a private member's bill, and obviously since um, by the Earl of Lytton um, via the Building Safety Bill, and now the Leveling Up and um, Regeneration Bill. Um, the latest legal text that we um, have published on the Building Safety Scheme website um, clarifies the previous concerns around the risk of judicial review, clarifies the routes of appeal and also the definitions of building safety risk. Um, the vote was actually quite close um, last time at the Building Safety Bill stage and we are very much hoping that it will now be implemented having dealt with all the previous concerns. Um, obviously, the Grenfell fire in 2017 exposed a catastrophic failure in building safety regulation and the construction industry as a whole, which has left tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of leaseholders living in unsafe homes. Um, leaseholders have unfortunately been left with bills um, running into five or six figures for costs of remediation. This has resulted um, also in increased insurance charges, increased service charges, waking watch fees, etc. Um, a number of leaseholders still can't sell, they still can't remortgage, and they're simply stuck. Um, this has had catastrophic implications for some. Um, I'm sure a number of you are aware of the very sad case of Hayley Tillotson, who was the first leaseholder who actually became bankrupt as a result of the crisis. There have also been a number of forced evacuations over the last six years, 27 in total. The last only happened last week at a student residence in Colchester in a building that's only actually been open for a year. 
Um, furthermore, there's some recent data that has been suggested by the National Residential Landlords Association that um, in terms of the leaseholders who are excluded from any protections under the Building Safety Act, there could be as many as 400,000 leaseholders who don't qualify for protections living in buildings over 11 metres in height and an estimated 1.3 million in buildings below 11 metres in height. The average bill um, is somewhere in the region of £75,000 um, and we have Amanda here uh, today who will explain in further detail the personal implications that being an unqualified leaseholder has had upon her. Um, we've also obviously there are a number of situations where there are buildings um, who do t potentially qualify for funding but there are also a number of unqualified leases in the leaseholders in that same building and therefore the re remediation is still not happening because there is a mix of qualified and unqualified leaseholders in that same block. Building Safety Act um, 2022 did provide some leaseholders with varying degrees of statutory protection from the cost of cladding and non-cladding remediation costs and interim fire safety measures. With funding coming from a mix of the Building Safety Fund, developers pledges and landlords. However, the developers contracts actually only account for around 10 to 15 percent of all remediation required on buildings that have still got defects. Um, there are obviously also a number of problems with the current position because there are still significant amounts of leaseholders who are currently excluded from any form of protection. That's, as, of, as, as I've already said, those in buildings under 11 metres, but also those who have been franchised by to let owners who own more than three properties, which is disproportionately affecting pensioners and even those who have actually become accidental landlords as a result of this crisis, and those who have also extended their leases after the 14th of February 2022. Um, furthermore, if a leasehold flat is unqualified, then it remains unqualified upon sale or inheritance, and it will therefore lose significant value, and a three-tier market has essentially been created for those who are fully protected, those who are subject to the caps, and those who are completely unprotected. Then we also have the issue of lenders still not lending, and this problem is only going to get worse with the implementation of the Basel 3.1, um, which is coming into place um, in 2025, um, which basically means that lenders are increasing capital requirements before lending, and homeowners simply won't be able to afford their mortgages anymore, particularly in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Furthermore, there are also issues with the waterfall process. It is our view that it is very unfair and it is also incomplete. Caps are also payable over a 10 year period and no works can actually start until full funds have been received. There are situations where the leaseholder may pay up to the cap and then the landlord or the head lessee would be responsible for any costs over and above the, the cap. But there's been no guidance in the Building Safety Act as to what happens if the landlord can't pay. There is a significant risk, therefore, of freeholds a sheet into the Crown. This, again, leaves leaseholders in significant legal limbo. Furthermore, there are significant risks of the current position within the Building Safety Act of litigation. The government is currently leaving it up to the courts to decide whether it would be just and equitable to grant remediation orders, building liability orders and orders relating to the costs of insolvent landlords. Furthermore, if there's no agreement on scope under the Responsible Actor Scheme, there is no clear route of appeal under the Building Safety Act, and this would likely resolve in lengthy, expensive litigation, either to the construction courts or via a judicial review process. Landlords may also not have the funds or willingness to want to pursue litigation under the Defective Premises Act. This, again, will leave the leaseholders in properties unable to sell and also in legal limbo. There are also significant problems within the conveyancing industry itself. There was an article which was re released a couple of days ago which stated that the general consensus from transactional property lawyers is that there are parts of the Building Safety Act which are simply baffling. This is to the point where many are refusing instructions where a landlord certificate is needed because there is a huge fear of negligence claims. Um, and my colleague here, Zara, is going to comment more on that. Um, again, lenders are still not lending because of all the problems. And this may then lead to high interest rates, adding on to mortgages and banks also having to put extra capital aside. 
leaseholders simply cannot afford this, especially in the current climate. We believe with the amendment that is being put forward by the Earl of Lytton that the holes in the Building Safety Act with the implementation of the Building Safety Remediation Scheme have been solved. There is a chart which shows a summary of where leaseholders still remain unprotected or liable for costs. Even where a leaseholder is qualified, there are still questions over the de definition of what a life critical de defect is within the developer contract because there's no actual legal definition in those contracts. Leaseholders can still be liable up to the caps and if the freeholders don't have the funds then the leaseholders are left in legal limbo once again. There are also no protections at all for buildings under 11 metres or waking watch costs. And as we've seen in, as I've mentioned earlier, the very sad case of Hayley Tillotson, people are becoming bankrupt from waking watch costs alone, and that is simply an unacceptable position. The Building Safety Remediation Scheme, the aim of this is to protect every leaseholder from all cladding, non-cladding and waking watch costs. It is an alternative proposal which would substantially reduce financial stability and public finance risks. The amendment has been tabled by the Earl of Lytton, drafted by Daniel Greenberg, who is the former parliamentary counsel and current parliamentary commissioner from Standards. And we've also sought advice from a highly experienced counsel who's actually acted as the lead counsel for one of the core participants in the Grenfell inquiry. He's also been instructed in very large scale construction and cladding disputes. Um, and my thanks um, go to David Sawtell for all his invaluable advice to us. Um, both have full confidence that the building safety remediation scheme has the potential to solve the building safety crisis. And it is simply a logical next step to the responsible actor scheme, which is already in place and the foundations laid in the Building Safety Act. It works in very much a similar way to the Motor Insurance Bureau. It doesn't rely solely on government funding. It ensures that buildings are fully remediated, homes are made safe again and it ensures that trust and faith is also restored within the industry. Slides which demonstrates just how poor practices have been um, within the industry for a number of years, completely missing fire breaks in our building. We also found out that there were beer cans in the middle of our walls. Um, if that doesn't demonstrate shoddy practices, I don't know what does. Um, and obviously, whilst the government are responsible for the deregulation, and they should pay significant funds towards remediation because of that, the taxpayer shouldn't pay for the entire crisis when it is clear that negligent practices have been ongoing within the industry for decades. If the government did pay for everything, then the industry is essentially getting a bailout and the culture, the construction culture simply won't change. And this has been demonstrated recently with the student block that I've mentioned earlier, um, which there's been a full building evacuation. and The building's only been open for a year. Um, so obviously the people, developers just aren't learning from their mistakes. And this is why we do need consumer protection and we need to ensure that buildings are built properly in the future. In terms of the practicalities of the Building Safety Remediation Scheme itself, it is essentially a statutory scheme which covers all leaseholders for cladding, non-cladding and waking watch fees. Simply put, if a building didn't comply with regulations at the time of build, then there will be joint and several liability against the developer and lead contractor. If neither are able to pay, they met regulations at the time of construction and now don't because of the regulation changes or the developer no longer exists, then the industry wide levy will apply. The building safety remediation scheme also provides leaseholders and lenders with certainty that homes will be fully remediated. It provides a vital layer of protection as the Building Safety Act also specifically excludes enfranchised leaseholders and common hold owners and allows government to basically move away from leasehold and move to a common hold process, allowing leaseholders to take full control of their homes. At the moment, that simply is not possible when the Building Safety Act specifically excludes this category of leaseholders. Um, the scheme can also work in conjunction with the Building Safety Fund, which is already in place, and it will bring in a larger pot of money to claim back from those responsible for this crisis. In terms of the assessment and terminations process, the assessment will be done by qualified building safety inspectors, and they'll look at documents such as BBA certificates and approved document B. They'll be looking at things like basic installation de defects, such as missing fire breaks, internal fire stopping breaks, 
incorrect render thickness, all these sorts of issues, which it's very clear cut whether there's been a regulatory uh, breach at the time. The freeholder or building owner, once the assessment process has taken place, will then apply to the building safety remediation scheme for a determination on what works are required, whether the building was built to regulations at the time of construction, and then for a grant to remediate the defects and pay for waking watch. If a breach of regulations is found, then there will be joint and several liability against the lead contractor and developer, and the defects will also be published on the Government Public Register of Determinations website. Again, this will hopefully go some way to stop bad practices in the future. If breaches, however, are difficult to prove, then um, all the developer lead construction no longer exists, or the defects are, redu- are due to a regulatory failure, then the wider construction industry levy will apply, which will bring in companies such as cladding manufacturers. I mean, we all know what happened with Kingspan and, and Celotex in the Grenfell and Kari. They need to pay um, and you know contribute to this crisis. Once that has all happened, then the freeholder or building owner will then receive funds to start remediation without any lengthy court proceedings. There are a number of positive aspects to this scheme. It gives consumers protection. I mean, we are in an utterly ridiculous situation in the UK where you have more legal rights for a shoddy toaster than you do for a flat. And that is simply just, you know, unacceptable and it's got to change. The scheme holds developers and those responsible to account. There is no apportionment. As we've seen historically, this is as isn't the VCUP system in Australia. It ends up in very complex and lengthy litigation, but our scheme completely avoids that. There is still, however, the option for developers and lead contractors to pursue satellite litigation or appeals should they wish to do so. And I will discuss the appeal routes shortly. The backstop should essentially be on the construction industry rather than innocent leaseholders and landlords, and it is also the least unfair option. It also supplements the building safety fund, um, as obviously there does still need to be an element of government liability due to deregulation, but these schemes can work in conjunction with each other. So in terms of the routes to appeal, um, we've had quite a few questions around this um, and following the advice from um, the Construction Council, um, we have been advised that there are two, essentially two routes for appeals. Um, Construction adjudication is a regularly used form of ADR. There is a right to refer a dispute to an adjudicator for a determination and that is mandatory for most construction contracts and regularly adopted. The first tier of decision making under the Building Safety Remediation Scheme would be adjudicators appointed by the Secretary of State. Compulsory construction adjudication for disputes arising under construction contracts was introduced into Section 108 of the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996, and the legal processes for construction dispute resolution have therefore been well established for over 30 years. Adjudication proceedings are a rapid form of dispute resolution with a determination usually being made within 28 days of referral. Extensions can be sought, but they are still usually concluded within two to three months. It is very rare for decisions of adjudicators to be challenged and therefore they do achieve de facto resolution of the dispute. This was discussed recently by Lord Briggs in the case of Bresco Electrical Services and Michael Lonsdale. A building safety remediation adjudicator's decision as to whether a building is eligible for the scheme is therefore final. This is safe for any obvious cases where there are jurisdictional elements, but it is very, very unlikely that the High Court would become involved. In a building safety remediation scheme, adjudicator's decision as to whether a party should be liable to pay for remediation will be subject to an appeal by a tribunal. Sections 123 and 124 of the Building Safety Act already give the tribunal jurisdiction over remediation orders and remediation contribution orders and improvement notices under the Housing Act 2004. Therefore, the tribunal is already well set up as a competent and effective decision maker for these types of disputes. The Building Safety Remediation Scheme also imposes a stricter form of liability than under the the Defective Premises Act, where a leaseholder must prove that the defect arose from a breach of workmanship standards, a professional standard, or from using inappropriate materials. Um, I'm now going to read a quote from our Construction Council, um, David Stortel. 
he stated the following, the dispute resolution framework under the proposed building safety remediation scheme borrows a number of features which are already either familiar to construction law practitioners or which have already been introduced by the Building Safety Act. The use of adjudication with a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal is likely to, divert to, likely to divert most of the disputes away from the High Court. This should also be contrasted with the serious cladding and other building safety defects disputes under the Defective Premises Act, many of which are subject to lengthy, concept, complex and expensive litigation. The part, this part of the, the part of the proposals that we're putting forward are therefore entirely consistent with the overall policy of the Building Safety Act and the developers' pledges and remediation contracts, but it is a much more streamlined process and it also restores trust and faith in the industry from the Register of Determinations. In any event, we are still of the view that appeal lists appeal risks are still likely to be low after a few initial test cases. No builder is going to be able to argue that they met regulations when there's no fire breaks or beer cans embedded into the walls. So in summary, the proposed amendments to the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill provides for the establishment of a building safety remediation scheme. The overall goal of the amendment is to build upon the policy and framework already in place with the Building Safety Act. It is a streamlined process, it is quick, straightforward and cost effective. It allows remediation to take place, it allows the market to get moving again, it allows for more funds into the remediation pot and it allows for leaseholders to finally move on with their lives. Homes can be made safe again, trust and faith is then restored in the industry and it also allows a, mood, a move to common hold as it, it protects those who have enfranchised and it protects all unqualified leaseholders. I've put a link to the website, which has a number of explainer videos, media articles as well. Um, and lastly, I would lo like to thank you for your time today. And I would also like to urge all MPs, peers, stakeholders, leaseholders, industry professionals to use their position to push for the much needed consumer protection that we need in the UK. As, as I said earlier, it is just a ridiculous proposition that you can return a solid poster, but you can't do anything about, you know, the biggest purchase of your life. To all the peers and MPs, I would say please do use your votes wisely to enable the Earl to push this amendment through the House of Lords and thereafter the House of Commons to ensure consumer protection now and for the future, to ensure that leaseholders are fully protected. The most important issue that we need to consider, consider is that we are now six years post Grenfell. We need to make its homes safe urgently. And we need to free those traps. We need to get the market moving again and we need to ensure that no more Grenfells ever happen again. Thank you. Uh, Alison, that, that's a, a fantastic summary. Of, I should just say that uh, we, we have a great privilege of having uh, uh, various um, peers here, Lord Best, uh, Baroness Cohen, uh, Baroness Pinnock and, and Lord Stunnell uh, here, um, and all of whom have been been uh, absolute uh, stalwarts in terms of of, uh, of sticking up for the interests of uh, of affected leaseholders. Um, perhaps we can move on to uh, to you, Zara, um, to give us your view, as it were, from the conveyancers' standpoint. Hi, my name is Zara Oli Bokas. I am a practicing solicitor with over 20 years' experience in residential conveyancing. I specialise in shared ownership leasehold transactions. You're probably already aware and fully conversant with the provisions of the Building Safety Act as it currently is. And you've just heard Alison already speak about the flaws with the current legislation. My aim is to make you aware of the real and practical difficulties us conveyances in England currently face. The reality on the ground is that solicitors are turning away work where the property is affected by the Building Safety Act. There are several reasons for this. I'm, there's lots of unanswered questions. I'm still, I'm still seeing lots of queries and misunderstandings between EWS1, the External Wall Safety System, and the Building Safety Act provisions. I'm actually seeing disputes regarding the height of the building. You would have thought that would be something simple to measure, but I've had landlords that are trying to distort the guidance and who have said 
or, or claim that a five storey building doesn't qualify as it's under 11 metres. <clears throat> the landlords do not know or are pretending to know what they need to do. There are many who are simply unprepared and not able to give the information requested in the certificates. Some also do not want to give the information as it's commercially sensitive. There is some doubt as to whether or not there is a complete bar for the landlord to make further claims and service charges after the four week period. So you could have a situation where a landlord gives information at a point where the property is sold or in many cases there will simply be no certificate available and if that buyer then purchases the property in 18 months time they could potentially end up with a landlord certificate from the landlord saying oh we've just found this out we want to try and pass on remediation costs through service charges. <clears throat> so where that arises a leaseholder would not have any way of knowing or proving what information the landlord knew about at the time they purchased the property so that they can fight any service charge bills. I deal with shared ownership and many of these landlords have a dual role as head leaseholders or head landlords themselves, meaning they don't own the building and so have to go to a third party to obtain the complex information in the landlord's certificates. Landlords are simply not able to provide the information required within the four week time scale. So a decision has to be made by the buyer and the lender as to whether or not they're prepared to proceed without the landlord certificates. The certificates themselves are also cumbersome to administer. The leaseholder certificate only provides for one signature. It's a legal document and should be signed by all leaseholders. Conveyances have no way of in verifying the information is correct. We are relying on landlords and leaseholders being honest with us. Given the above about landlords not being prepared, whatever information we get back in their certificates could be littered with mistakes. For example, when I'm dealing with housing associations, the people on the front lines do not hold legal qualifications. They are lay people, not trained to navigate and prepare such information, which even lawyers are finding difficult. Another issue we are facing in relation to the Building Safety Act is the lease extension loophole. As per government guidance, we are asking for landlords to voluntarily preserve the protections. Most are refusing as there is nothing in the legislation to compel them to do so. The Building Safety Act has created not an anomaly by the fact that a lease extension is deemed a surrender of the existing lease and so you're given a new lease when you extend it. M meaning, <clears throat> so the dilemma is this, you have to extend your lease before it gets to 85 years to be able to sell it to somebody who needs a mortgage. But if you extend it, you lose your protections because the 14th, it's been extended after the 14th of February 2022. Leaseholders are stuck between a rock and a hard place because they can't sell it as no one will want to buy it if the protections are lost. There's lots of leaseholders trapped waiting for an answer. I also need to raise the position in respect of executors. There are owners of flats who have died before 14th of February 2022 and after this date. Lawyers have not been given any guidance as to how to determine qualifying status for these flats. Bear in mind that some of these flats have been caught up with a cladding crisis due to EWS1 and have not been able to sell. Rent and service charges are still payable by the executors to the landlord until the flat is sold. Some have been paying out of their own pocket so as not to lose the asset. Now coming to the most important factor in all of this, mortgage lenders. Mortgage lenders are increasingly asking for more documentation. Some of the lenders even went as far as to say conveyance should be verifying the complex accounts given by landlords in the certificates. That is simply not practical and we are not forensic accountants. The UK Finance Handbook Part 1 are asking for these certificates on all flats regardless of height. 
there's a huge lack of understanding on the part of the lenders or have they actually got it right because the le because the flats under the 11 metres have no protection at all. So what they're looking for is the magic number as to how much the leaseholder could be liable for. I'm a conveyancer, I can't give them that information. I saw a sto story in the news where a leaseholder was charged £21,000 for cladding to be removed from his three-storey tower block. And that was the cost to him as an individual. Going back to the landlords not being able to provide their certificates within the four week time scale, some mortgage lenders may decide not to proceed if they know that there's no certificate available because we're not able to establish the position. Who is going to want to buy a flat when their lawyer tells them, oh, by the way, on top of the nice premium you're paying for this flat, which is yours for a limited time only, the landlord could charge you unlimited costs to fix a building where the defects were not of your making. OK, so what happens if the leaseholders don't pay? Well, the landlord can repossess the property without returning a penny to the leaseholders. If you've taken out a mortgage, you will still have to find a way to pay that back too, but without a property to sell. Most leases, unless they are shared ownership, don't come with a mortgagee protection clause. But even then, those housing associations that have given these guarantees or they're the head landlord and have given an underlease have given these guarantees to the mortgage lenders, which means that the housing associations themselves may end up having to pay out of their own pockets to repay these mortgages as they've unwittingly become leaseholders themselves. So mortgage lenders are worried about lending because of the risk of them not being able to get their money back has increased significantly. Giving someone a mortgage is a calculated bet that you'll get your money back. However, with no leaseholder protection, the likelihood of that diminishes. So you can see why lenders are going to be reluctant to lend on these flats. People won't be able to sell or remortgage until the, the market is opened up. You may have seen in the news about the rising interest rates in mortgages. So Having a lot of these flats that are buy to let, it simply won't be profitable for the landlords to remain in the market. So you will see a flood of these flats coming onto the market. I have been told by estate agents that these flats are difficult enough to sell as is since EWS1 was brought in. The Building Safety Act has just made this worse, even for those who were able to secure the pointless EWS1 forms. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a residential conveyancing conference where the first discussion of the day was the Building Safety Act. I heard, of cry I heard cries of, that's not fair, coming from behind me, when the realisation dawned upon those in the room <clears throat> that there will be a two-tier market. <clears throat> but coming to Alison's point, it's actually a three-tier market. Those flats with protections and those without. <clears throat> So those flats without protection are going to lose huge value and will likely re remain completely unsellable due to the risk of unlimited liability. Further still, it's difficult for conveyances to provide comprehensive advice because there are still so many unanswered questions to the point that the professional indemnity insurers are telling solicitors not to do the work because of the chaos created by the current legislation. What happens then if the flat's repossessed? No one's getting their money back because the flat can't be sold. We will have a dead duck in the water and a stalemate between the landlord and the leaseholder. No buyer will want to buy a flat where they'd have to pay the previous owner's debt. So as part of the conveyancing process, we have to make sure that the well for the previous owner's debt. This has far more serious consequences for those individuals who are forced to give up these flats. Bankruptcy proceedings means that they could lose their profession, their jobs, their income, but also another indirect consequence in that they won't be able to rent a property. If you've got CCJ's bankruptcy proceedings, you cannot even then get your foot to show that you can pay your monthly rent. 
This will then in turn perhaps bring more homelessness to the country. People want certainty, not just the people buying, but the lenders too. Most of us lawyers don't feel comfortable being able to advise the clients to, effect, to buy a flat affected by the legislation. We've been told by a professional indemnity insurer that we should not act on these as the risk of advising on the same will not be underwritten by them. I understand the same is going on with surveyors in terms of measuring the building height and valuing these flats. You could have two flats in the same building, exactly the same, but one lower in value because it doesn't come with the leaseholder protections. We are now in a situation where we have to apply medicine to heal the wound. The solution provided by the Earl of Lytton provides a method by which to fund the repairs so leaseholders are not liable. It will provide certainty to the market and so lenders will have some confidence to lend again. It will actually help the landlords too, many of whom have taken on these buildings from developers. They shouldn't be paying for defects that were not of their making. Consider this, if you buy a car and it is defective, you have the right to take it back to the manufacturer to get it fix it, to fix it. Why is the current legislation therefore making people who bought these properties in good faith pay to fix them? I have only touched the tip of the iceberg here. There are many deeper issues that need to be addressed within the construction industry, as well as fire safety issues. I'm asking you here to do the right thing, which is to support the Earl of Lytton's amendment. People's lives are at risk. It's not just about the money. The, lease, the government can't afford to let the leasehold market come to a standstill. Conveyances have just been through a stamp duty holiday. I can assure you it's no holiday for us. There would have been more activity in the market had these flats been marketable. You may not be able to see the consequences at the moment because the figures from the land registry and, and the data collection take time to come through. But the crucial thing is they don't monitor which flats are in the higher rise buildings. And something needs to be done as soon as possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. And that um, uh, is a, uh, it's a really sad um, account of, of where things have, have got to. And I, that's the thing that uh, passed me. You refer to, you were both very kindly refer to it as my uh, amendment and indeed it is in my name but I have to say I stand very much on the shoulders of others who laboured long and hard to get this 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 through um, but let us press on because um, uh, Amanda if you could just briefly give us your view on the the thing from the leaseholder standpoint I think that will sort of bring us full circle and then we'll open up for discussion thank you Hello, I'm Amanda Walker and I'm a non-qualifying leaseholder um, and I'm here to explain the impact that that has, the personal impact and the impact for everybody in my situation. Um, I mean, it, I think you can imagine from what you've been hearing, it's devastating. It's just a quagmire now. It's just chaos. And I was sucked in about three years ago when I just, I remember where I was. I remember everything about that moment because I realised straight away we got an email from my managing agent with a link. And in the email it said, uh, we're under threat of a prohibition order from the fire brigade. And if we don't implement a waking watch and change all the fire alarms and various other things, fire doors, et cetera, we'll all be evacuated within 28 days. And you've got to bear in mind, this was in the middle of a pandemic. So there's nowhere to go. You're barely allowed to sit down on the street or be out for more than an hour. So it was kind of crazy. And then the waking watch, none of us knew what prohibition orders or waking watches were at that point. But then we had all these sort of random people in high vis jackets wandering around our apartments at a time when the message of fear was being pressed you don't go near anyone so that was a bit disconcerting it was a strange thing to do at that time where was the danger but um yeah and it also I could just see the chaos and you can hear it from Alison and Sarah it's it can't work so now as soon as I was halfway through the link which was some an internet review about what was going on and I just thought there won't be enough resources to make this happen in good time it, it, there isn't enough money who's paying for this we're talking millions and at that time material costs are going up labor costs are going up you know it's a pandemic as well 
So we took second. Nobody was interested. No, they only cared about that. Um, and anyway, we found out because some people were trying to sell. So our freeholder, who is also my neighbours, I didn't buy the freehold. In fact, they bought it before I even bought the apartment. So I'm just a regular leaseholder. I pay ground rent. I have no say in anything. But because some of my neighbours bought it, we're considered enfranchised. Hence, I am now disqualified from all help and with, without any plus side at all. And we were told, get ready for, we had a meeting following the email, get ready, get ready for 70,000, 200,000 and get ready now. So that was three years ago. Still haven't had that big bill, but now I'm going to get it because it's just, it's, this is the thing, it's the unknowing it's the fact that you're just being churned up in this. And I joined the campaign scene behind the scenes. This is not my comfort zone doing this at all. But um, I did everything I could, went to the protest, wrote. But, um, and then watching, watching the Building Safety Act went through. And just one by one, they all got kicked out, along with polluter pays, all the amendments that would have protected us. And then when I found out I was considered non-qualifying, it was, I mean, again, penny dropped immediately. Like they said, a two-tier system. Why would anyone buy a non-qualifying in perpetuity flat? I wouldn't, with what I know. So at the moment, we're in the, we got the building safety fund, but they kept putting it back because the cost was spiralling. So we got an agreement for like two million. But by, by the time they came to do the work or gave us the money because they didn't give it straight away, it was four million. And so they were like, well, we can't give you four, but... And like, if you wait another year, I think some spark somewhere said, if we wait another year, it'll be six million. So we're in the process of having our external works done. But obviously, the internal works, we failed everything. We got a B2 rating. There's polystyrene behind our walls. There's no fire breaks, no compartmentation. And as they're doing the external works, we're having regular meetings with the construction company. And they are finding more and more defects that aren't covered by the building safety fund. So it's just escalating. You know, it's it's uh, we cannot pay. The, it's impossible. And as we, Alison and Zahara was saying, there'll be buildings where there are part qualifying and part non qualifying. So even the qualifying won't be able to go ahead because you know who wants to even take the forfeiture? Uh, my my neighbours don't particularly want. Uh, it's an, a liability now. And there'll be a run on the banks because there'll be loads of. I mean, it hasn't started yet. This this it, what I've had and what's been difficult an understatement, is the threat, this sword of Damocles over my head for three long years, tomorrow, tomorrow, get ready, tomorrow, and then there's hope. It looks like, you know, the no leaseholder will pay rhetoric, and then they vote against us on everything. And the waterfall, last point of call, it's bound to be the leaseholder in almost all cases to will pay whether it's the cap or unlimited, which is my case. And I was on sale before I became non-qualified. And I had, I've had two eager buyers, one before the BSA went through. And they were very eager to buy the flat. And I was very open and honest about where we were, that we got the building, safety plan, et cetera. But as soon as we got, so I had the lawyers, so, you know, months and months of preparing all the documents, getting everything ready. We get to that long, even though I told the estate agents, tell them everything that we know. There's a lot that I don't know. I have no idea how much my bill will be. I I imagine it will be unpayable by most of us. But it's um especially now. Uh, I had two sales, but they uh, the Building Safety Act came through and I had to say non-qualifying the, the landlord certificate. As soon as they see that, gone. Then I had another buyer who was really keen, cash buyer. As soon as they see non-qualifying, ah, I'm out. So that's how it's going to be. And I've tried to explain this to my fellow leaseholders, some of whom are leaseholder freeholders, because they're still on the hook for it. It doesn't really help them being freeholders right now, except they're also responsible people. We had a meeting the other day with our contractors. There are about 100 residents, then there are 61 flats. So some are tenants, some are owner occupiers like me. There was one person who turned up to this meeting, me. Not one resident showed up. But then after they all come, and I kept saying, every time I saw someone, don't forget the meeting on Thursday, don't forget the meeting on Thursday, they didn't show. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, so what, what happened? I'm like, You've got to support this. And it's the same, like none of them have ever turned up to protest. I've never seen anybody there. So there's this general apathy. But I think the issue there is that the truth will out. It will hit the fan. 
I, I was just consumed by this and writing always on Twitter, just trying to get as much information. Steve's been very helpful. And, and unfortunately, information can sometimes hurt, like ignorance is bliss. So not knowledge, I couldn't unsee what I saw or know what I know now. And when we became non-qualifying, that was just the final, the icing on the cake. It's like there's just this black chasm ahead. So unless the polluter pays goes through, or the building safety remediation scheme, as it's now called. I mean, it's just, I don't see a future for this. And I don't see how government can think that this will work because it just won't. The big bills will start falling. Bankruptcies will happen. As we said, people will lose their professions. I'm very angry about this situation. This, it doesn't, it's so unjust. I've done nothing wrong and it's destroyed my life already. Mm. Amanda, thank you so much. Um, it's actually heartrending to hear your story because it's one that I've heard from so many hundreds of, of other people. Um, and uh, it's, um, I think there is this this lack of awareness, I think. I think that there is a, there is a sense that, oh, well, the government has put this in place and, and, and so it must be all right, mustn't it? And I think that's the narrative the government would like us to all understand. Um, but this seems to me to be, uh, you know, a time bomb waiting to, um, to, to go off. Um, I have concerns beyond the immediate effects dire though they are for individuals, and that is um, the, uh, you know, the potential effect if this starts to take hold more generally in, in the leasehold market. And um, I think probably everybody in this, this room knows that I, I don't particularly take sides on this question of whether it's you know, traditional leasehold or, or common hold, but whatever we have that's that's in place at the moment has to function and there has to be a market that functions. Otherwise, you know, we are rarely stuck. And if, if we get into a nightmare scenario where you know, uh, um, the, the, the market, the lenders, the insurers, uh, turn their backs or even not necessarily overtly turning their backs but somehow this becomes you know not the sort of thing we want to 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 back then that's that's a potentially huge write-off for a, a, a lot of people and if it's not an actual present day write-off then it's a write-off in terms of the performance that it would otherwise have achieved in terms of its sectoral uh, performance as against other residential um, property types but um you know, enough from me. Uh, you all know why, what it is that drives me on this particular thing. But um, colleagues here and, and those um, online, maybe you have um, uh, questions you'd like.